lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about today to many fields. So without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. The agenda for today, uh, kind of high level, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that are facing many industries. And uh, a lot of these challenges, all of them, are going to be addressed by 3D printing in some way. We're going to then go ahead and cover the Stratasys printer and material portfolios and their capabilities. Um, like Tim mentioned, uh, this is a more of a military focused presentation. So all the use cases are going to revolve around that, but they can be applied to many things. I'm going to briefly cover the GrabCAD print software, which is the software that Stratasys machines use. And then we'll have time for some Q and A at the end. So, uh, just to start off, some of the challenges facing many industries, uh, including the military, uh, one of the biggest ones right now in this COVID epidemic, pandemic, is the main the need to maintain independence in the supply chain. I think we've all found various places, whether it's toilet paper or PPE or whatever it may be, um, the ability to, uh, no matter what's happening in the outside world, be able to rely and be self-sufficient is something that I think a lot of companies are finding to be very important, something that we might have taken for granted. Connected to that is keeping intellectual property private. Um, before this whole COVID thing took over the news, there was a lot of news stories about companies being hacked or government corporations uh, having leaked emails and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, the need to keep intellectual property within an organization and uh, protect yourself, and especially when it comes to manufacturing, uh, outsourcing, very uh, restrictive information. Um, if you can keep that internal, uh, that's going to be something that's going to be very, very good in the coming years. Uh, another challenge that we're all facing right now is the need to respond to a rapidly changing environment. You know, that can be going from ventilator shortages to no swab shortages. Um, when I was thinking about the military for this, I was thinking about the need to stop everything, respond to maybe a potential IED on a bridge, or apply immediate medical attention to an injury, or to, you know, make shift a solution to a broken device to get you back to base or something. Um, the need to respond rapidly is ever important in these days. And lastly, a challenge that every organization faces is the need to improve efficiency at all levels in an organization, whether that means creating a special device for a maintenance person to make their job more efficient, or to make a device that prevents the maintenance person from needing to do maintenance. There's efficiency improvements that can be done at all levels, and saving a few gallons of water or making something a few pounds lighter can make a big difference when things are pushed to their absolute limits. So. All these challenges uh, are going to be addressed in this presentation, uh, specifically with uh, Stratasys 3D printers. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the Stratasys technologies and printers and materials that are offered. Uh, the first one is FDM, or Fused Deposition Modeling. This is a technology that Stratasys invented in the late 1980s. It's by far the most widely, com widely used and common 3D printing practice today, both for hobbyists and industrial use. You can think of it essentially as a giant hot glue gun, except instead of hot glue, it's, uh, it's using plastic. So uh, there's heated nozzles, plastic gets pushed through those, um, it comes out the ends, and there's an XY coordinate system gantry that's moving around that you have the ability to create objects layer by layer. Um, one of the unique things about Stratus system printers is that most all of them use a separate support material. Uh, that's really nice to have because then uh, you can create a part with overhangs and uh, internal geometries and then be able to soak the support material out of the part later on. Uh, these machines can range from uh, layer thicknesses from five thousandths all the way up to 20 thousandths of an inch, depending on what you need, whether it's good detail or a fast model. So there's quite a few materials in the FDM portfolio. The most basic one are the standard plastics. Uh, this is kind of conquered by ABS. 
that's the stuff that Legos are made out of and uh, many, many things that we use in our everyday lives. Um, they have a PLA plastic that is really great for fast prototyping. It's a little cheaper than the other materials, so you can go through some more iterations in a more economical fashion. They have a rubber like elastomer that's uh, good for printing flexible tubing or soft to the touch items. Uh, we have electrostatic dissipative materials. Uh, these don't build up static, which make them great for circuit board housings or other static sensitive components. Um, the example here is a fixture for an assembly line, um, keeping that circuit board protected. We have a low friction material called Duran. This material is really great for surfaces that are going to be rubbing against each other. It's an, it doesn't mar surfaces, um, which makes it really great, especially uh, for end of arm attachments. We have some high strength materials like nylons and polycarbonates. But the strongest of those materials being a carbon fiber blend that's offered on a few of our machines. That's the strongest material that we offer. Uh, there's also FDM chemical and thermal resistant materials like Ultim and Intera with PEC. And lastly, we have some specialty materials like materials certified for the aerospace industry, for uh, the food industry. And we also have a sacrificial tooling material that's printed and can be dissolved away for composite carbon fiber uh, molding creation. All of these materials are offered on different printers on the portfolio. Many of these materials overlap on the same printer. Um, the printers are separated into two main categories. We have the shared office series and we have the production series. The shared office series, these are the printers that are going to fit in your office. They're pretty easy to use. You don't need a dedicated operator. However, that doesn't mean that they're poor machines by any standard. They print very high quality. They have a wide range of materials available. Um, I have two of these machines in my office and I can vouch these are really nice machines compared to working with hobbyist printers. We've got the production series on the other side. This is where you get into the much larger print envelopes. These are for printing. Um, actual end use parts, um, very customized, uh, short run types of parts. These are very large printers. <laughs> the other technology that Stratasys offers is polyjet technology, where FDM was akin to a hot glue gun spraying plastic. This is akin to your household inkjet printer, except instead of spraying ink, it's spraying a photopolymer that's then cured as it's um, after it's being laid by a UV or ultraviolet light, it goes back and forth, laying material, curing, laying material, curing, and you're able to build up and create some very highly detailed uh, prints. Similar to an inkjet printer at home, this has full color capability, and it, you can get accuracies down to 14 microns, which is less than a half a thousandth of an inch. So. These are very capable printers for high accuracy, high visual fidelity. Unfortunately, photopolymers don't have the same kind of name recognition as some of the FDM materials. So they can be broken down into four main categories. We've got our rigid materials. These are materials that um, come in all sorts of colors. Uh, you've got cyan, magenta, yellow, black, white, clear. You can combine them in different ways to create different shades and hues. You've got flexible materials. These are materials that can go down to a durometer of 30. And um, these also come in black, white, and clear. We have medical materials. These are biocompatible materials for use in the dental industry. We also have some medical focused materials that can simulate uh, bone and tissue which is really nice for preparing for surgeries or practicing uh, different medical procedures. And lastly, we have heat resistant materials. This includes a digital ABS material that simulates the strength of ABS, but isn't gonna start melting when it gets really hot, which makes it very useful for blow molding, injection molding, and other high temperature applications. 
one of the most unique things about the PolyJet portfolio is the fact that you can create digital materials. So this is mixing all the materials you saw on the last slide together. So you can create uh, over 500,000 different combinations of materials. You can combine flexible and rigid to create different levels of flexibility. You can apply textured looks to items. Um, this center console model for a car is a very good example. You've got simulated flexible leather on the top. You've got uh, the threading that's simulated uh, in the actual leather. And then you've got this very beautiful wood grain texture that was applied. And all of this was printed in a single print job. So the PolyJet uh, technology is really capable of uh, reaching that very high visual fidelity that some industries need. A look at the printer portfolio, there's a few more categories here. We've got the shared office, the easy concept, and the realism focused. The shared office, very similar to the FDM shared office. These are printers that don't uh, require a dedicated operator. Uh, they might not have as much material selection, but they can still pack a punch. They fit into your office. And especially with the, the newer printer on the leftmost, the J55, um, it actually has full color capabilities. So Stratasys has really upped its game in this shared office area. We've got the easy concept models. These are printers that are less focused on creating every color under the sun, but more focused on uh, very accurate parts and flexible parts. These have larger print areas for those larger projects. The real and focused printers, these, are similar to the easy concept, except they incorporate that full color ability to get that very high visual fidelity. There's a few other types of printers as well. Um, there's very, very, very large polyjet printers that can print full sized wheels. And then we have some dedicated medical printers uh, for the dental and medical industry. The rest of this presentation is going to be spent going over some example use cases for using all of these different uh, technologies. So they're split into three main categories. Uh, we're gonna start with maintenance. Uh, this is things like the ability to repair anywhere in the world, um, wherever you have a 3D printer that is. This, this image here is an impeller fan that was for a light armored vehicle that was 3D printed on a Stratasys machine as a replacement while the original was on back order. Next up, we have customization. Um, this involves making devices or parts that are customized to that in individual situation. In most cases, creating these types of customized parts wouldn't be economical, but with 3D printing, that math changes. I and mean, this example is of a drone wing with a customized internal wiring path. And then lastly, uh, prototyping is probably where most of us think of 3D printing normally. It's the ability to prototype in-house, use lots of iterations, bring the costs way down, and take on uh, different organic and complex geometries at a fraction of the price of traditional manufacturing. And this example is of an environmental control duct on an aircraft that was produced on a Stratasys machine. So we're going to focus on maintenance first. And similar to the top of the presentation, we're gonna start with going over some challenges. Some of the challenges that maintenance faces, uh, the first one is the loss of an essential part. Um, if you need a part to do a mission and that part isn't there, that mission gets put on hold. Uh, that can mean PPE in a hospital setting. Uh, that could mean, um, you know, if you lose a flat tire and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you need that essential part back. Um, specifically with mission critical parts in the military, um, that can set uh, an entire squadron behind. And replacement parts can take weeks to reach a team. So once you've got that lost part, it, there's parts in the military that can take up to a year to be replaced if they're not mission critical. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those in a second, but just the, the, the need to have a replacement part very quickly is a challenge that faces a lot of maintenance focused um, industries. Some parts require ordering an, an entire assembly. 
So if you break off a part of a radio, you might not be able to order that individual part. You might have to replace the entire unit, and that ends up wasting all the good components that were on the original. And then lastly, keeping a stockpile of replacement parts takes up valuable space. So um, with any stockpile or with any stock room, having all of those parts needed for um, you know, repairs whenever they come up, if you overstock, you're going to take up way too much room with all those parts. And that's also something that's addressed to 3D printing. So our first example was in the news quite a bit um, earlier in the year, in 2019. It involved uh, printing a toilet cover for a uh, C5. But there's a lot more to the story than just the headlines of a toilet cover print. So there was uh, the maintenance squadron in Travis Air Force Base in California. They worked with the FAA to create um, a Stratasys certified um, the ability to create uh, airworthy parts on a Stratasys machine. And it just so happens that the first approved part for production was a latrine cover. That's the part that you see on the right. Um, with a lot of these non-mission critical parts, they can normally take a year to get replaced. However, with Stratasys 3D printing, they were able to create two parts or two covers in less than a week, which is a time savings of well over 99%. And normally these latrine covers have over a $10,000 price tag. Part of this is due to the fact that the last C5 to roll out of the assembly line was well over 30 years ago. And there just isn't a huge market for C5 toilet covers. So, um, we don't know the exact costs, but the estimated cost for 3D printing was around to be $300 per, which is about a 97% estimated cost savings. So this was a very successful program. Uh, the military already, or the Air Force already has a large backlist of items to print, and that's only gonna continue to grow. And this isn't gonna look like it's stopping or slowing down at any time. And the articles I found didn't even take into account the fact that this uh, hexagonal uh, support structure is going to create a lighter part, which is going to be very useful. Um, the Travis Air Force Base used one of the largest FDM printers available on the market from Stratasys, uh, the F900, to create these large parts. Next up is a very simple part that hardly any of us ever consider, but they're all around us. Um, almost every water faucet in the country uses a water splitter or an aerator to pressurize the water coming out of a faucet. It reduces the amount of water waste and it creates higher pressure water, thus allowing you to wash your hands, shower much more efficiently. Um, you can always recognize an unaerated faucet by the glossy laminar flow that always looks so pretty. Um, but if you're on, say, an aircraft carrier, the need to save water resources in every step of the way can have a huge impact. So um, in this example, there was an aerator that was broken. And instead of waiting for a replacement or replacing the entire assembly, what they were able to do was 3D print uh, a replacement aerator. Uh, this probably took minutes to print. It's a very small part. But uh, the keeping a whole bunch of these faucets correctly aerated is going to end up saving a lot of water resources down the line. And this could have been printed on any of the FDM printers. Um, it would be a best fit on one of the smaller shared office printers like the 120 in the corner. The next couple of cases involve looking at uh, this Dauntless Sea Arc air, or boat that's used for patrolling harbors. Um, there are many parts on this vehicle that match the challenges that we're talking about. Um, the first one is an exhaust flap that's used on the boat. This flap prevents water from entering into the exhaust. Uh, these aren't replaced very often, but when they are, they have a very long lead time. So with 3D printing, a replacement part was able to be designed, printed, and test fitted, uh, presumably in just a matter of days. And the added benefit to this is that once a, re a correct replacement has been created, that digital CAD file can be shared internally and 
those parts can be printed on other in other harbors for other uh, dotless sea arcs that need that part. The material cost on this part was less than forty dollars. And while we don't know the actual cost of a replacement part, um, that's probably cheaper or akin to. So um, this part might not be a one-to-one -one replacement for the exhaust flap. While you wait for the uh, the one that you ordered to come, you can use this 3D printed one to bridge that gap between ordering the replacement and receiving it. And if you quickly address issues like this when they come up with 3D printing, you're going to require less maintenance down the road. Uh, another part on this uh, craft that needed created was a fuel cap key. So you can see on the picture on the right, there's this black plastic key. That was used to open the fuel caps on the boat, and they only had one left, and they were unable to order any extras. So what they did is they were able to use a Stratasys 3D printer to 3D print their own key and have as an extra. And while this may not seem mission critical, um, the presumed relieved stress behind losing the key by having a replacement readily available. Um, you know, you can't really put a cost to that, but that's got to be very valuable to the people on uh, the boat. And like with the exhaust flap file, this digital key file can now be shared and reprinted as needed. And a part this size could be 3D printed in a matter of hours, and you could print it overnight. So it'd be ready to use the next day, keeping uh, people useful during the day. This part could also be improved upon as well, like incorporating more holes for mounting it to structures or magnets uh, to keep it magnetized to the boat or to put, um, you know, reflective material to keep it visible when it falls into the water. So all these examples were printed on Stratasys FDM printers that were the predecessors to the shared office series. Uh, the F120 in the corner is one of those printers. This next example goes over the challenge of needing to replace an entire unit. So um, here we see an antenna that uh, you can look and see the part that's circled in red is really prone to breaking off. It's a fragile component. And when you're out in the field, um, it would get bumped into, and especially at sea with the boat rocking, um, these would end up getting broken quite often, and it required replacing the entire component. So um, because of this, uh, some people decided to uh, create a protective cover by 3D printing uh, using FDM. And as you can see on the pictures in the middle and on the right, uh, with that cover, you're able to protect that fragile component, and that's going to be uh, a maintenance time save, a cost time save, especially considering that the new cable was around a 25 day back order time. So to wait 25 days just to get it back versus printing off a cover in two to three hours, there's a very large time savings there. Um, with something like this, it could have been printed on any of our printers, with uh, any of the FDM Stratasys printers, but uh, a Fortis printer would do very well with mass producing these for like an entire base. The last maintenance example I have is a place where a lot of these are already being implemented uh, in the military. This is the X Lab. It's short for Expeditionary Lab, and it's part of the U.S. Army's Rapid Equipping Force. This is uh, this is a project that started over ten years ago by um, creating this lab with 3D printers and welding equipment and metal fabrication equipment and deploying it downrange in Afghanistan. And um, it was so successful in equipping and helping uh, soldiers in the field that it's now um, been deemed an integral part of the military. Each lab is built in a 20-foot shipping container with 3D printers and a CAD workstation. So you're able to create CAD models um, in the lab. You can 3D print that design, um, go through testing, 
And then they are also working on making an enterprise wide product data management service so that when a file is created, it could be deployed to other X labs and printed for those soldiers and units as well. So these labs have an open door policy so that any soldier can come in, describe the mission shortfalls that they faced, and they can start brainstorming ideas and solutions. And while this isn't focused exclusively on maintenance, um, there's plenty of items that they've printed uh, that are maintenance focused, like grease gauges or bottle caps or other small things that um, might, might not seem mission critical, but as you start to lose more and more of those smaller items, um, you know, it, it adds up. So these printers are currently employing the precursor to the F370, which is the most powerful printer in the shared office series. And um, I imagine that these X labs are gonna be a lot more maintenance focused in the future, similar to what we saw at the Travis Air Force Base with the toilet covers. Going over some of the benefits gained, um, these address the challenges that were mentioned earlier. You, you have the ability to produce parts that are much cheaper. Um, many of the costs that come with these parts that we've looked at in this so far come from the fact that there can be very specialized markets. Those specialized markets can uh, produce parts that don't have a high demand. So if you have the ability to create a replacement that uh, is a fraction of the cost, that can be very useful, especially in um, tense time sensitive scenarios. And you have the ability to get parts faster. Since you only rely on the filaments that's available at your disposal, you can uh, 3D print those parts as needed. And as long as you have that filament, you can you know, create as many as you need and get them the next day, print them overnight. There's a lot of self-sufficiency with 3D printing, especially when it comes to maintenance. When you're not relying on other organizations for those parts, that's another um, issue that was with the latrine covers is that uh, those parts were created somewhere else in the world and they had to get them uh, shipped back to the US. So if you can print those parts, be self-sufficient. Um, when the times get tough, like they are in this pandemic, you really have the ability to maintain national security. Uh, you can improve devices, which re then requires less maintenance. You have a greater efficiency, like we saw with those antenna covers. Um, it's very useful. There's lots of little improvements like that in every organization that I've been involved in um, that 3D printing really has the ability to address. The digital files that are created uh, in the computer that end up being used by the printers are very small. They fit on a hard drive. They take up very little room. So instead of having a giant warehouse or a stock room full of parts, you could have a set of 3D printers that take up a fraction of the space and print those parts as needed, uh, which lets you either reduce the amount of storage space you have or use that storage space for something else. And one of the most important things to keep in mind is that these capabilities are only gonna continue to grow. Um, we've seen some huge advances in the industry in just the past few years, and it has no signs that that's gonna start slowing down anytime soon. Um, it's even being used to print PPE equipment in this pandemic. And, you know, with the economy very uncertain, 3D printing has not gone away at all. So that's a really big positive right now, really big benefit. So we've covered one of our three example use cases. We're going to focus on customization next. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is focusing on making things uh, ergonomic lightweight, customized to that specific purpose or person. So some of the challenges that come with customization, usually it's very costly. So if you customize yourself a bike seat that's you know specific to uh, your body, that's gonna cost a lot of money. And if it breaks, it's not gonna be easily repairable since all customizations are kind of one-offs. Um, so oftentimes generic devices are chosen over customized devices, but those generic devices often lack comfort or efficiency. Um, 
I think a screwdriver is a great example. Uh, they're very nice. They fit most all hand sizes, but they are not ergonomic at all. <laughs> Traditional manufacturing doesn't lend itself to creating ergonomic or lightweight designs. Um, since most traditional manufacturing is a subtractive technology, it removes material from a block. Um, removing more and more material is going to cost more and more money and time. And so um, with 3D printing, it's an additive technology. So it directly addresses that traditional manufacturing. Getting into that, um, one of the most basic examples of customizing is making things lightweight and ergonomic. So um, if you were uh, stationed out somewhere and you needed a lighter grip or a grip that was more fit to your, um, your device, you know, you have the ability to print that. I really love this bucket example. Um, if anyone has carried tons of water in one of these buckets before, you know that that handle just cuts deep into your fingers and into your palm. And, you know, spending a few minutes 3D printing, uh, you know, a little handle for that bucket going to only take a few minutes to print that and it's going to make everybody's lives a little easier um, especially if you're in an arid environment or an environment that's pretty harsh so um, these are great uses for the shared office series of printers um, since they are pretty small and you can print them on demand the next example is uh, airway training so um, Oftentimes, um, every personnel needs to take on some kind of CPR or airway training, and especially in the military, uh, doing life-saving airway procedures such as inserting a trachea tube. Uh, there are critical skills for both battlefield and civilian medical personnel. And learning these skills and keeping them in your brain requires lots and lots of honed practice hours. but the models that had been created in the past were pretty generic. Um, and so what uh, the, I think it was the University of Michigan was able to do, or the University of Minnesota, they partnered with the Army to create uh, much more anatomically accurate uh, tracheas uh, for use with these uh, tracheal tube procedures and other life-saving airway procedures so that uh, Personnel, whether they're in the military or not, can have the ability to feel what it's actually going to feel like, the ridges, some of the geometry in the throat. And another great thing about this is that since it's 3D printed, if it ever breaks, you have that file and you can replace it immediately. It seems like every CPR training I've ever done, one of the dummies is broken and it's too expensive to fix. Whereas here, um, you could even create uh, different versions of this trachea for somebody with a larger trachea or somebody who had an injury. So um, the, the ability to customize a training to fit exactly what you need um, is, is something that's very valuable when it comes to making sure that people's skills are honed. And 3D printing really allows for that to be done. With parts like this, they definitely fit on a shirt office series. You probably wouldn't have to go much larger. and Using a machine that has the capabilities of the uh, more advanced Insight software that Stratasys offers, um, like the F370 in the corner, uh, that would be a very useful device to create these. Now we get into our first PolyJet example, um, the digital anatomy printer. One of the biggest challenges when practicing medical procedures is getting hands-on time. And normally to do this, you need either human cadavers or animals to practice the touch and feel of stitching a heart or grinding a bone. Most of these practice procedures uh, will give a good feel, but they're unable to exactly replicate the anatomy of something like somebody with a hole in their heart or moving through vascular structures. So to address this, Stratasys worked with several medical professionals and created the digital anatomy printer. This printer is able to um, recreate um, very accurate to the touch and feel, uh, different parts of the human body, including the heart, bones, um, and these vascular structures, like you see in this little GIF. They're able to actually simulate what it would 
look like if there was a blood clot flowing through somebody's veins and how to address that. Um, the digital anatomy printer is something that came out pretty recently, and um, I'm actually getting one in my office, and I'm very excited to see what its capabilities are. Um, another really cool example of what it can do is you can 3D print bone that has different bone densities. So here you see that the bone marrow is actually flexible in this little GIF, and they're able to 3D print bone that can be more or less uh, brittle to simulate the aging process or somebody with a bone condition. So um, especially in the military, there's some very far reaching uh, applications for this technology. You could uh, recreate commonly seen ballistics wounds or um, create customized models for somebody that might have gotten an injury years in the past that was unable to be operated on. And uh, through some scanning, you could uh, digitally recreate an organ and then practice that procedure, you know, 10 or 20 times with the accurate touch and feel to make sure that you're gonna do it right. So. Um, the digital anatomy printer has huge implications in the medical field, and I'm very excited to see where that one goes. Our last customization example is this trainer development flight system. Um, in Shepard Air Force Base in Texas, uh, the trainer development flight facility is a facility that designs and develops training aids for the Air Force and the Department of Defense. And that includes things like training on avionics, weapons, fuel systems, HVAC, and other technologies. And uh, in the past, what they've had to do is they've had to rely on either using uh, broken devices or using uh, you know, an actual device and then using it for training purposes, which can be very expensive, especially with something as complex as a drone. So what they've been able to do is using uh, Stratasys F900, they've been able to 3D print um, different parts that are of the same types of material and strength, um, but make them as dummies instead of using all the actual internal parts. So here we have an example of a drone that was 3D printed, and they're able to do simulated maintenance, go over uh, different areas on the drone, and go over common failures in a very highly detailed markup without actually using a real drone, uh, which saves a lot of money. And had it, this uh, first printer that they purchased had a return on investment um, that was half the time of what they expected. It was a very valuable uh, machine. I guess I have one more customization example. This one's pretty interesting. Uh, this is another use of polyjet technology. Uh, the story behind this one is that um, the military approached Stratasys to look at uh, creating a 3D environment uh model and what they were able to do is using just data from google maps this is just a recording of somebody exploring uh cape pendleton south in california on google maps they were able to take a video of themselves doing this break it out into several different screenshots and then merge all those screenshots together using a, a cad system and then they were able to uh, recreate this and actually print it out on a Stratasys machine with accurate um, visuals and accurate uh, scaled heights. So you can imagine that this technology could have very far-reaching implications if you wanted to recreate um, anywhere in the world that has Google Map data, whether that's uh, hostile territory or using it for training purposes. So. Um, this whole process I thought was something very valuable. Um, it, it really, uh, having the full color capabilities there um, lends itself to being far more accurate than past abilities to create models like this. And this was done on a full color polyjet printer, um, such as the J55. So going over some of the benefits gained from 3D printing and customization, you have the ability to produce parts that are customized to their purpose. You can make parts that are lighter. You can make more comfortable grips. Um, that, these adjectives are shared pretty well. Lighter, stronger, and ergonomic. These are all very uh, great things. 
you have the ability to prevent mistakes if you're making something that's more specialized um say like a screwdriver handle um, you're going to prevent people from uh, getting uh, repeated motion injuries they're going to make less mistakes there's going to be less fatigue with the lighter piece of equipment less injuries in the workforce and especially in things like the medical training you have the ability to gain such a greater understanding through using more customized and advanced devices which is going to be very valuable down the line the last thing we're going to cover in use cases is prototyping um, this is the most common area that 3D printers have been used so far, I would say. Um, it's been used in many different industries for prototyping and with a big focus on iterative design. So some of the challenges that have faced uh, prototyping in the past, prototyping, uh, it's, it's used in all parts of the production process. So whether it's concept validation, a functional, fit form function testing. Um, a prototype is going to be used in all parts of a design process. And with that, um, iterations are one of the most helpful things you can do. But if you're using traditional methods, those iterations can have long lead times and be very costly. So oftentimes, um, iterations are cut short due to time or costs. And this is an area where intellectual property can be highly compromised. If you're outsourcing your prototyping of sensitive equipment to, um, you know, even across state lines, you don't necessarily know what's going to be going on with those files. And the ability to keep all of that internally is something that is becoming uh, more and more important. And lastly, more complex parts require more complex manufacturing. So, as parts and get more ergonomic, more customized, uh, more, more fit to their purpose, you need larger and larger things. So whereas a, you know, a three axis mill might have worked a few years ago, you might need a five axis mill now or a six axis mill. And these machines get more and more expensive uh, when using traditional manufacturing. So as you can probably guess, 3D printing addresses all of these challenges. Um, the first example that we're going to look at is the Hall to Jaws, which is a, a military aircraft that was designed in India. The gas turbine research establishment in Bangalore went through the design process of the gas turbine engine. And what they ended up doing is to optimize the layout of their subsystems within the engine in order to minimize things like pipe length. Um, they they created the whole thing in CAD, and then they actually 3D printed over 2,500 FDM components to create. It's technically a rapid prototype, but it's it's very large, and it took over a month. But um, to do this using traditional manufacturing just wouldn't have even been feasible. So um, the ability to uh, create the entire system, including all of its subsystems, to get your hands in it and look for places to optimize is something that um, we'll never really know the cost savings or the weight savings of doing that but there are some things that you just can't see in a computer model and you have to do it by hand so um, this is also all done internally with an f900 so they were able to prevent any ip loss from those files going out into the public the next example is a, uh, an example from the University of Navarra. Um, this is a university that uh, focuses a lot of resources on their formula student engineering competition, um, where they go and compete against other universities. And what they decided to do is they wanted to create their intake manifold out of carbon fiber in order to reduce weight and lower fuel consumption. And doing a carbon fiber mold traditionally takes a lot of resources and time. But what they were able to do is with Stratasys 3D printing, they were able to 3D print using the sacrificial tooling material, their own molds. And then they were able to um, go through the necessary procedures to get these molds ready. And you can see in the picture on the right uh, where it says pixel and systemis, that is the carbon fiber part that was created from these molds. So um, there's lots and lots of different industries that are focusing more and more on carbon fiber. 
And the great thing about the Stratasys sacrificial tooling material is that you can print one off and though it gets dissolved when you use it um, and dissolve it out, you have the ability to print those off as needed. They're not gonna take up a bunch of room and um, they can maintain, maintain accuracy as you iterate your design. You're not needing to modify existing molds. You can print new ones out. And the sacrificial tooling material is available on the Fortis line of FDM printer. Our last set of examples focuses back on the X lab from earlier. There's many different prototyping scenarios that the X lab has gone through. The example on this slide, the picture on the right was a, uh, a trip line hook that uh, a soldier came in and talked about they wanted one that could collapse and lay flat so it's not taking up as much room in a backpack. So what the X lab was able to do was they were able to uh, 3D print a CAD, a CAD version of this as their prototype, make sure it met all the, the qualities that they wanted. And then they were able to use their metal fabrication to create the final design. Um, so even though this is a metal device, uh, 3D printing wasn't void. Um, it was still used in the prototyping process. Uh, another example here is of this it's a beacon, and in this case, the final product is 3D printed. So the, uh, there's this beacon that was used. Uh, it's an infrared beacon to issue to soldiers for identification and marking recovery sites. And you had to plug and unplug the battery to turn it on and off. And it was a two-part system that required both of your hands, and you couldn't mount it to anything. So XLab took all of those comments and iteratively designed this. Um, you can see where it says Duracell ProCell. That's the final complete prototype on the right. They were able to incorporate an on-off switch. They were able to add uh, flanges for mounting it to things. And it was able to be operated one-handedly. So um, the picture on the right actually shows them mass producing um, these uh, the black plastic uh, finalized products. And then those would be you know, shipped out to whoever needs them. So uh, a production 3D printer was used in this case. And probably the last and most dramatic example um, comes from uh, the, an issue that the Army had with its NRAP tires. Um, the parts circled in red was an aluminum um, stem that was used for manually pumping tires on an MRAP. However, these would protrude from the tire and oftentimes break off, uh, leading to uh, rapid decompression of the tire. And these things don't carry spares. So if that tire goes down, you've got to wait until a spare shows up. And so this was a huge problem. And um, it you know, compromised the people in the vehicle and their location. And so what the X lab was able to do was they were able to 3D print um, some prototypes that would protect the stem, even as it's scraping on walls and whatnot. And we went through that same iterative design process and the final product went through its test trial. And in the picture, you can see it got a little dirty, but this protective cover was able to prevent that deflation and uh, keep that vehicle uncompromised. So some of the benefits gained, you've got more iterations, uh, faster iterations, that's gonna end up giving you better devices. Uh, with in-house prototyping, you're able to protect your own intellectual property. Um, you can design for the future. You can, um, you know, like with that last example we had, um, it's still designed so that you can manually inflate that tire. You could have designed it to, you know, have it as a part that is destroyed when you need to manually inflate, but you can design for the future uh, with the future in mind. And lastly, um, the example on this slide, you can create organic uh, shaped objects or use uh, nature as inspiration. So this is a hydraulic intake manifold used on the V-22 Osprey. And it's, it was 3D printed to be lighter, less restrictive to the fluid flow and less prone to leaks due to its natural shape. And it kept its strength due to the nature inspired hexagonal structure in the back. So. Um, that's the overview. That's all the use cases I have. I was going to go over get GrabCAD print. Um, I'm kind of running low on time, so um, I'll be quick about this. 
So GrabCAD Print is the printing software that these printers use. Um, it works with the FTM in PolyJet. You can import native CAD files. It tells you, it does the slicing. Uh, it tells you the estimated material usage and build time. And the most important part that you should get, take away from this is that it's free. So if you are interested in any of these printers and their capabilities, you could go download GrabCAD Print now. I think you just need to make a free account and then you're able to uh, import those CAD files you might be interested in printing. And so that's all I have. Well, thank you everybody for your time.